Hello, and thank you for tuning in today. We are finally set up here in the office for our fourth episode here on MCR of NGP Speaks. NGP Speaks, just so everyone knows, is a podcast format, an interview format, where I bring on incredible people that I've known for a while, uh, many years, uh, very talented people. We've had Rye uh, do a few rounds of NGP Speaks. We also had my friend um, Current, the digital nomad that has lived in San Francisco, LA, New York, Berlin. He's a very uh, multicultured nightlife connoisseur. Uh, had him about two weeks ago. And this week we have Furious. So Furious, how's it going? Let me just go ahead and, and toss the mic to you, but welcome to, uh, to the show. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, first and foremost, um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, I love everything that you guys have been doing here at Miami Community Radio. And for those of you who are meeting me for the first time, my name is Furious. Yes, that is my real name. Um, just a quick history about that. My mom uh, was a huge fan of the actor Lawrence Fishburne um, at one point in time. And around the time I was born, there was a movie called Boys in the Hood. And his character, who was a great father figure character in that film, was named Furious, uh, Furious Styles, to be exact. And that's where my name comes from. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of people think it's from Fast and the Furious. And I'm like, no, guys, I'm not that young. I'm actually 10 years older than that. That movie, um, I, pre I precede that movie by 10 years. So, because that film debuted in 01. I was born in 91. So, <laughs> nonetheless, um, I'm a producer, songwriter, and composer, born and raised here in Miami, Florida, um, most notably um, in uh, the Liberty City area. Um, actually, is where I was born and raised. Um, I've been all around Miami. Um, I've been doing music since I can remember. I started out as a rapper. Um, at the tender age of eight years old, uh, my brother, uh, uh, Michael, my cousin, who goes by Fat Daddy, was what we used to call him. Um, and I started like this rap group and it was just something for fun, but I was actually the only one of us to take it seriously. And when I was in elementary school, I actually built up the confidence to rap for a couple of my peers and they actually liked it. And that gave me the confidence to continue a quick side note that I, you know, you know how sometimes memories will come back to us um, randomly and there'll be memories that we'll, we'll cherish. And I had a memory come to me randomly. One of my best friends from elementary school who I used to rap for um, also went to the same high school I did. And this memory came back to me recently of me and in my sophomore year, I was in the classroom and I was writing some rhymes and he comes up to me and he sees me writing rhymes and he goes, Furious, that's so dope that you're still doing that. You realize you've been doing that since elementary, right? And you've been good at it ever since. And that was just super awesome to not only that he remembered that I had been doing it since elementary, but that he was still confident in my ability to uh, write lyrics, you know, um, to, to a high level. That was just such a great memory. And it just came back to me randomly. And I, I just couldn't help but smile, you know. Um, but continuing on around middle school, I became, um, I started to get into songwriting. So not just hip hop, I started to write rock, even some metal, um, cause I was new to, you know, listening to a lot of metal, um, even, uh, R and B and pop, I tried my hand at, and I realized that it was something that I also loved doing. And it was that moment that I realized that when I learned music production and composition, it was that moment that I literally told myself, there is no way I am going to become a music producer and composer and only box myself into one genre or style. There is no way it's not happening. I, will, I would like to produce hip hop, R&B, pop, rock, um, you know, music from different cultures. Um, I'm a huge fan of J-pop, of you know, Japanese uh, pop music. Um, and same with composition. Um, I might want to do a classical piece, but I might want to do a modern composition piece um, inspired by one of the video game composers 
uh, Nobuo Uematsu, who does a lot of the final, who used to do a lot of the Final Fantasy music that I grew up a huge fan of. You know, I, you know, I might want to do that. And so in 2009, when I started learning production and composition, that was my goal. And the rest is history. Well, that's a very difficult statement to follow up on. Um, I I really love kind of the intro that you gave yourself there and how you ended on kind of J-pop and also OST culture. When I was in New York, I was hanging out with a friend backstage and we were talking about Ape Escape, how PlayStation 2 and Dreamcast and like all these different like video game consoles changed our landscape and our influence. And uh, a lot of those composers are Japanese. And they were on some type of psychedelics or something because like, <laughs> like it's just it's unbelievable the, the kind of compositions that they made back then and just kind of the themes, even like Donkey Kong, um, just like, wow, right? It's just like absolutely mind blowing in terms of arpeggiations, in terms of bass, in terms of like uh, drums, uh, harmonization. So, yeah, there's so much to kind of like explore and to, to you know, take a part there. I do want to kind of regress back into the earlier statement that you that you made about growing up in Liberty City. So for those that don't know, what was it like living in Liberty City as a kid? And where is Liberty City? So Liberty City is an area that's, from what I can understand, it's actually currently parts of Liberty City are being gentrified as a lot of inner city areas around the country are. For those of you, um, I'm sure a lot of you understand, but for those of you who don't know, gentrification is when an area is brought out, actually. And unfortunately, gentrification comes with displacement because the people who live in these um, areas, which were originally meant for lower income uh, residents, um, now can no longer afford to live there because they make these areas nicer, but they also raise the price of living there. So, but that's a whole nother topic. We can, we can explore. Yes, but that's what, from what I hear, parts of Liberty City are being gentrified. But G Liberty City is an inner city area in the northwest part of Miami. And um, it's growing up in Liberty City, like, like most areas, you guys have heard these inner city areas referred to as a lot of things over the years, the ghetto, the hood, and all of that, all of the things that get associated with those areas are, the, the, the great thing about growing up in these areas is one of the earliest things I learned is when you're, 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 when you're growing up as a kid, you see all this crime, you see all of the drugs that you randomly see laying on the sidewalk, and you feel like like you will become trapped in that mind state or in these activities. You feel like you might become a victim of the street life or gang culture or a criminal. And way early on, uh, I had some very important people, whether it was teachers at school, um, whether it was family members, whether it was friends, thank God for these people. They're all a blessing because they told me, do not let this place define you. This is a place where you live, but it doesn't have to be something that defines you. And so, yes, uh, I did see a lot of crime. I did see, you know, a lot of uh, drug addicts. I did see a lot of addiction, a lot of pain, a lot of different emotions running through people who wanted to get out of this environment but felt like they were stuck here. And these were some older people and maybe they felt like it was too late. And I did see a lot of this, but my goal was at an early age to not let this area define me. And that was something that I strive to do. And what happened was the, my first big uh, realization of understanding that there is a whole world outside of this area that I'm so proud that I come from. Like I'm so proud I come because things that I've seen and things that I've been through only made me stronger. It made me understand uh, the class system in this country and how systematic oppression was put into place um, way at some point in time to keep certain people in these ghettos. And it, I learned and I researched and I talked to older people and I talked to more knowledgeable people who understood this and they gave me the knowledge of understanding why this area looks like this. There's a reason why um, you're supposed to feel like you're going to be trapped here. That's what the people who put these places um, into like execution, that's what they wanted. 
And you making it out is a great way to show them that, no, there's more to me than this place and you will not keep me back. And I remember um, growing up, we took public transportation a lot because my family, you know, we were poor. We didn't have, you know, like a, always have cars. They did, but not always. So sometimes we would take public transportation. I've always been a very observant person, so I pay attention to everything. So when I was younger, I would pay attention to what bus we got on to go where, what bus goes where. And it was around uh, like the 2006 point in time where for the first time I was I had to go somewhere I had to be somewhere and I had to do it on my own so I asked my grandmother for you know like uh, back then the bus was way cheaper I think I asked her for like a dollar 75 and I went out and I caught the bus on my own for the first time and it was a liberating experience because um, I'm also visually impaired which is something I did not mention before I was born with cataracts Let's talk about this. Yeah. yes this is very important to note because this um, is very essential to my growth and development. I was born with cataracts as a baby, congenital, and they removed the cataracts, but then that turned into glaucoma. So I do have glaucoma, and I've always had it. And my vision used to be a lot better when I was younger. It has progressively gotten worse, but thankfully, another blessing, I haven't seen any worse progression in a few years now. And that seems to be... Uh, stable so that that's a great little like blessing and I'm happy for that and, and I'm going to continue to take care of my eyes and hopefully keep it that way but it was a liberating experience not only to to know that I could do this but as a visually impaired person to know that I could do this you know that I could get out here on my own and not have my hand being held by my my friends and family and then um I started to explore more. When I, whenever I did get a little bit of money, um, I would actually literally, I would literally get on a bus and I would ride that bus all the way to wherever it, the last stop was just to see how far it goes, where I can do. And I've done that. I've, I've spent like hours on a bus, you know, um, going all the way to the end of the route and then going all the way to the opposite end of the route to learn my way around the city and how to maneuver on my own. And... I started to explore different parts of Miami, Coconut Grove, Dadeland, South Miami, and I that was when I really realized there's an entire world outside of Liberty City that I've yet to explore. I know those streets like the back of my hand in Liberty City. I've been all around. I used to walk a lot too, so I used to walk all over Liberty City. And, you know, I would walk from 7th Avenue to 27th Avenue and, you know, from 79th Street to like 95th Street, all type of stuff, um, you know, you know, like to get to friends houses because that was sometimes the only way I was able to get there because I didn't always have money for the bus. But then I started to learn there's an entire world that I've yet to explore. So same thing. I would get on the Metro Rail. For those of you who may be listening that aren't from Miami. Uh, the Metro Rail is a train system that we have that's actually above ground, and it's easy. It's a way, a transportation, a method to get from one part of town to the other uh, quickly. So similar to if you guys are in New York, it's the closest thing we have to a subway, for example. So that's what the Metro Rail, so I would get on there, and I would, same thing, I would go uh, all the way to the end and all the way to the other end to see, okay, how far do they go and learn my way. And yeah, that's how I learned my way around the city and how to travel on my own. And it gained me some of the most free independence I think I've ever felt. It felt so great having that freedom and that sense of independence. So by the time I became an adult, I was able to travel and maneuver on my own. And the reason why this is all important is because it was a way for me to feel independent, but it was also a, a method of hope for other friends of mine who were also visually impaired, who felt like, how am I supposed to get from point A to B on my own? Well, it is possible if you put your mind to it and if you're just willing to learn. Absolutely powerful. Uh, the story and the context by which Furious comes from and the power that he stepped into uh, as an adult, right? As a child, things are very different. Um, because these are a lot of learned conditions, a lot of learned behavior, a lot of circumstances that you weren't asked to be in. And being a self-actualized adult, you're like, oh, wait a second, I have the choice. 
whether my circumstances define me or not. And having those role models was so important and critical, right, and pivotal. I do want to reverse and kind of go back to, uh, you know, something that you mentioned when it comes to these role models as like how we met. So we, we met, uh, do you want to talk about that, like the location and, and how that unfolded and how that manifested? A, a long time ago, I think it was like 11 years ago, 11, 12 years ago, yeah. So one of the places that assist blind and visually impaired people um, in the city of Miami is the Miami Lighthouse for the Blind. Now, it's not the only lighthouse location. They're all around the country. But the one specifically in Miami has a music program um, that went by the name of the A Better Chance Music Program. I don't know if that's still the title. I believe it is. But nonetheless, uh, I was a student in that music program from 2007 to 2011 and then I kind of graduated out of the program and became a volunteer from that point on. Around the time I was kind of graduating out of the program and becoming a volunteer, I met a young man in that program um, who was studying production in his own method, who has his own ide ideo ideologies in regards to how music is to be consumed and how it's to be produced and made. And this guy really opened my eyes to that fact that music goes beyond academia. Music goes beyond, you know, just studying music theory and composition all day to make sure that everything you do is so meticulously precise. And that young man was Nick. And that's how we met. We met in that program and we clicked right away because he would have a lot to say and I'm a good listener and I love to learn. Learning, I'm addicted to learning. It's one of my favorite things to do. I will never not love learning something new. It can be the smallest thing. It can be, you know, how to tie a type of knot or something. It can be, or it can be something as grand as, you know, how to, you know, play, how to utilize this particular chord on a piano. Either way, I love learning. And being that Nick had such a brilliant mind, I would listen and we would exchange ideals. And pretty much, like I always say, the rest is kind of history. We began to collaborate and talk about our different music taste. And, and one of my favorite things to do with my friends, this has always been, we begin to recommend music to each other. I don't think people realize how important that is. I, I can do an entire soliloquy on why recommending music to your friends and expanding their musical palette if they're open-minded to it is so important. There's so much music that I would have missed out on had he not introduced me to artists like Bjork, you know, and other artists that um, he introduced me to in uh, trip hop, for example, and things of that nature. I would have missed out on all of these incredible artists had he not recommended them. So... You know, that's how we met. And I would love to know um, your ideals on, because I've, I've wanted to ask you this for a while as well. Do you think recommending music to your friends and expanding their musical palette, especially when they are musicians themselves, is important as far as inspiration is concerned or even just casual listening? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fantastic question. The, the main thing that I want to go ahead and say right off the bat is 100%. I feel like we can learn so much from different genres and different cultures. Uh, you know, like I, I think about, you know, you mentioned Bjork and like Tibetan throat singing is really hard for most people to, to get through, right? Because there's two different tonalities um, when you're listening to, to that music, but you can hear the influence um, like throughout contemporary music uh, and yeah, I mean that's just one example of it. Even Gregorian chants, uh, you can you can hear like how in trance music, uh, <laughs> how the stabs or the chords emulate this very angelic, uh, you know, thousand plus year old tradition of of Christian monkhood. Um, but making all these comparisons can only be done if you study musicology, right? And and so this is a conversation of musicology more than anything else, like putting taste aside. So like. It's, it's kind of like food, it's like cuisine. Like some people like spicy food, some people like uh, halal food, some people like hot dogs and hamburgers, right? Um, but in my school of thought, it's nice to try something at least once, you know? Uh, like I remember the first time I tried octopus, this was like nine years ago. I'm, I'm vegan now, I've been vegan for, for a while, but my, my, my uncle uh, prepared, my uncle Del prepared uh, 
octopus for the first time, homemade. And honestly, like the texture threw me off a lot. And I was like freaked out, but it actually tasted like chicken, like how he cooked it and prepared it and even the seasoning. And I'm like, damn, this is actually really good, you know, like, um, and that's like totally commonplace for someone that, that comes from an Asian cuisine background, right? Just like seafood in general. Um, and so for me, that was like a first time experience as like an adult. And it was like, wow, like, like, I can't believe I lived all my life without, you know, trying this. Exactly. So I would just go ahead and say this in a musical context, like take a listen to something at least once, even if you don't like it and you have like a visceral response, um, it could be, you know, something that influences you long term, right? Like the first time I listened to Bjork, it was like, what's this? The first time I listened to Death Grips, it was like, what's this? The fr- you know, okay, so, all right, we can talk about Death Grips a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, MC Ride and Zach Hill. Um, Wait, hold on, let me, let me pass the mic. Oh, no, I didn't want to interrupt. Uh, oh, I was thinking out loud. Oh, you think not? No, it's all good, it's all good. Uh, no, Furious was just saying that uh, their influence has been just really like profound. And uh, yeah, Zach Hill, even before, you know, Death Grips was a part of a group called Hella and has his own like individual career, which is like more like rock, math rock. Uh, so like inspired by jazz, uh, polyrhythms, a lot of deconstruction of, of like uh, jazz motifs and, and rock motifs and everything in between. But yeah, seeing that in like a rock slash hip hop context, experimental like techno experimental, uh, you know, like group, like super group, like what Death Grips is, shows the boundaries of which like music culture is being pushed to, right? And so it's like what you were mentioning about like trip hop and, and just the recommendations that I gave you like years ago, it's important to be able to have your peripherals totally like blown wide open so that you have a 360 perspective as to what's going on in, in like modern times. And so when I talk to people nowadays, it's like, do you know what's going on in Lisbon? Do you know what's going on in like Cape Town? Do you know what's going on in like Tokyo? And most people don't know what's happening at all because they're not open to it, which is totally fine. And this actually comes back to a point that you made earlier about specialization versus generalist uh, like motives within the society that we're in. But most people kind of look down upon generalist practice and praxis in general uh, rather than like a generalist understanding of what's going on, like a holistic viewpoint as to like musicology and what we're going through in modern day. But yeah, like, you know, in my opinion, being a generalist is of utmost importance because you can appreciate other people's cuisine, dance, uh, like music, uh, literary works, art, right? If you don't have that holistic approach, then you're just taking it for granted or you're not seeing the divine value in it or, uh, you know, the innate cultural significance that it has to a certain subset of individuals, right? Um, So yeah, like, in a very oversimplified and like... (laughs) layman kind of response to your to your uh to your question i would say like for sure (laughs) i i would say like definitely listen to stuff outside of your comfort zone and because you never know what you're gonna like or what you're not gonna like and eventually like at some point you know so yeah that's uh it's, it's my opinion on that yes absolutely so one of the things i'm gonna do now um i'm gonna talk about my inspirations and I'm going to bring you guys into my world as far as what inspires me and how I use music to and how it inspires me in different ways. So for example, um, I did grow up playing a lot of fighting games. I, I didn't play a lot of video game genres outside of fighting games, but I do have an appreciation for RPGs. Um, the stories that those games tell are absolutely phenomenal. And my favorite video game of all time is a game called Tales of Symphonia. Um, it's an action RPG, um, Japanese developed. And for example, one of the pieces of music from there, which I'm about to play for you guys, it actually, funny enough, you might think, okay, this is a piece of a Japanese folk music used um, as um, in, on a video game soundtrack. It actually inspired me in one of my very first ever, and I wish I had it, but you know, some of the earlier works that I did way back in like 09, I, I don't know where they're buried out in cyberspace somewhere, but it inspired one of my very first hip hop beats. And I took this, this folk, Japanese folk concept, and I applied it to hip hop and just made magic. So we're going to do that right now. Is that okay? Yeah, so let me introduce this piece of music. It's from the video game Tales of Symphonia. It is 
a theme of one of the characters named Sheena. This is Sheena's theme from Tales of Symphonia. Yes. So that's uh, the piece for the most part. It's going to keep playing. Okay. And I'm just, I'm not going to talk over the entire piece. I'm just going to talk for a quick second and just give you guys an idea of what's going on here. This is, from my understanding, it's like the equivalent of basically folk music, but it's like Japanese uh, folk music is what this piece was inspired by. And it represents that character so well. And this actually inspired a hip-hop beat. And that's just to give you an idea of how inspiration can work. So there you guys go to give you an idea of how inspiration can work and how you, if you, like Nick was saying, open your mind to different uh, ideals and different cultures, different styles, you never know. You'd be surprised what will inspire you and what you can create. Don't ever limit your creativity. That's one of the biggest themes I could ever like teach uh, people who I've taught is don't ever, ever limit your creativity. Cool. So that was a, that was a pretty dope uh, track. Um, yeah, maybe we can hear it in its... <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. In its entirety, uh, once we have the the internet um, kind of running, I don't know if you want to like like load it up again or yeah yeah. But I mean just just to hear from beginning to end with with no stuttering. But um. But uh, yeah, I mean it's important to be able to take from different cultures and to to use different um like what you were mentioning about folk like folk music. You know, it's the last place that people would expect to hear a folk song, um in in a game, right? But the influence is palpable, and, y and you can hear it for sure. Um, do, do you want to play it now or yes, later? Okay, cool. So yeah, let, let's just let's rewind a little bit and, and try that again. All right, so we're gonna play it from beginning. It's a loop. Yeah. So this is a loop. So it's a little over a minute. So that's perfect. I want you guys to focus i want you guys to digest it and if you guys are into music maybe really focus in on it and see if it inspires you in some way shape or form enjoy
Yeah, so what I like about this piece is the use of strings and like the percussion. I like the rim shot and also the kick, kind of like how it flows, but it kind of also sounds like a sample that Dilla would use or like Madlib would use or um, like I can already hear all these different contexts that it could be taken from and, and kind of like articulated in a different way with a different style of music. But yeah, thank you for kind of playing it in its entirety um, and kind of giving it justice and respect uh, by, by playing it from beginning to end like that. So uh, yeah, do you have any thoughts th about the piece or... So, yeah, that um, is a very inspirational piece. But the, the thing is, what I also want you guys to take away from that is music is everywhere, right? Like ev we hear it everywhere we go. It's, it's in television. It's in games. It's, it's an, an essential part of life. I was playing and enjoying this video game. And in the midst of it, when that piece, when I first heard it the very first time on my first playthrough, I was immediately like, like oh, okay, I need to stop what I'm doing and listen to this. And that's kind of something that's very important, especially if you're into music, because once again, like there have been times where I'll be in public and I'll hear something. And if it's if it's within my ability to try to catch what song it is, um, thankfully, technology has uh, developed ways where we can actually do that as well now. But I'll be in public and I'll hear something. And I'll be like, wow, what is that? I like that. You know, I want to, you know, I want to hear that in its entirety. And now if it's if it's out of my ability, then OK, I'll try to memorize if, if it has lyrics, for example, you can, you know, look up songs with lyrics. Now I'll try to memorize as many lyrics um, or I'll pull out my phone, try to record it real quick um, so that when I go home, I can, you know, um, try to figure out what it is because sometimes it's for inspirational purposes, but sometimes it's just for casual listening, which I think both are important. Um, you know, I, I sometimes when I'm when I need like that alone time, that me time to just sit in and be alone with my own thoughts. Sometimes I'll, I'll need um, absolute serenity, but sometimes I will want music in the background to help me self reflect on how my day went, what's going on in the world. Um, to get a better understanding of one of the things you said that was very important, what's going on musically around the world. So um, I, I like knowing what's going on in Tokyo. I had a friend of mine um, tell me last night, he was like, uh, I was talking to him, and he said, um, he said, one of the things, I, he said, I cannot wait to show you uh, this boom that's been going on in South America. There's this movement of freestyle rap that's blowing up in South America. And it's like the vid I've been watching videos on it all day of these people all over South America, like freestyle rapping. And he was like, I can't wait to show you the videos. And I was like, oh, man, that sounds absolutely incredible. And then we started. Then he delved into a an, um, conversation with me about hip hop and hip hop's influence. And I told him, I said, here's the thing that I want you to understand. I said, hip hop's global influence is absolutely phenomenal. Hip hop has penetrated so many cultures and people have taken their own cultural ideals and put them into their own style of hip hop. It is so phenomenal to watch. Over the past, I would say decade and a half, seeing the big boom and the big global phenomenon of people, not only in the mainstream, but no, underground, deep underground, the deep cuts also, seeing what people have done uh, with hip hop, not only the cultural, but seeing people take jazz and making hip hop beat tapes that are jazz inspired, neo soul um, hip hop fusion. It's just everything. And um, like what my friend was talking to me about last night, freestyling, that was a huge part of hip hop, especially in the early days before uh, people were sampling. Hip hop started with people rapping over disco beats and they were freestyling off the top, you know. So seeing this global phenomenon that hip hop has become and seeing people being able to really express themselves creatively and not be in a box, not have to limit themselves. No, if I want to bring jazz elements into my hip hop, I can. If I want to bring classical elements into my hip hop, I can. That's the freeing thing about it. And I was explaining this to him and he 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 told me before we left, he so he had a better understanding of, you know, uh, how hip hop has penetrated these different cultures, you know. So 
just an idea or a theme, guys. Once again, this is going to be kind of the theme of today. Don't limit your creativity. If you are a hip hop creative, whether you um, if you produce, don't limit your creativity to, to you know, if, if trap is your forte, that's absolutely great. But you can take different elements of different styles and incorporate them into your trap beats or incorporate them into your boom bap or incorporate them into your trip hop or if you do uh, rap fusion like a, like a Rick Rubin style of rap rock or rock rap you can um, take different elements of electronic for example we were talking about death grips earlier and bring those into that rap rock fusion and you'll be surprised at the, the amazing sounds that you'll get so what are your thoughts on um, not limiting your creative freedom, not putting yourself in a box. How do you feel about that? Oh yeah, it's the only way to operate, especially as a cultural facilitator. It doesn't matter what type of music you're making or what kind of culture you're pushing, but it all starts with the production, right? It all starts with like, not even the mixing engineer, or mastering engineer, it starts with the producer, right? Um, because then DJs wouldn't have music to play. <laughs> if there were no producers, they'd just be playing the same songs all the time right so it's it's interesting to be able to deconstruct how we perceive certain uh tastes and, and culture in general but there's no way to innovate in my mind without having influence um and yeah just extrapolate from that in, in greater depth so that's just my immediate thoughts on that absolutely absolutely so um there's so many listen guys as you guys have already um understood there's so many different directions that we can go um especially with the different avenues that i've explored so i guess what we can do now is i will introduce you guys to one of the three tracks that i've prepared for you guys today um shout outs to all of the listeners of miami community radio um it is a pleasure to be here and i've brought some tracks for you guys and i hope you guys absolutely enjoy them there are three hip-hop tracks but they are on three different ends of the spectrum and um that's once again it's it matches the overall theme today of not limiting your creativity so how about we get into the very first one of these three tracks that i've prepared for you guys today i hope you guys absolutely enjoy it by the way this first track is called live sounds and it's a track that um a friend of mine uh, was and I were talking about live instruments in hip hop, and we were talking about um, the roots, um, you know, and how how good they are um, in that band. Um, shout out to Black Thought and the Roots, and how they bring these live elements into what they do, and how live instruments being introduced into the hip hop fold is just so great and so beautiful, and it actually inspired this piece of music and I hope you guys enjoy it. This is live sounds. Um, how do you, how do you feel about, um, you know, live instruments being incorporated into styles where people don't usually associate, uh, these live instruments we're, we're used to MP snares. Um, we're used to having our, our Akai MIDI keyboards, or our, our keyboards and our DJ with the, you know, our scratches and our turntables. And um, how do you feel about Digging in the Planets, The Roots, Zion Eye, and these um, bands that really, really bring these live instruments to life um, on that stage when, when, they're, when they're performing these uh, songs? Yeah, immediately what, what comes to mind is uh, actually Bad, Bad, Not Good. And uh, what I love about Bad, Bad, Not Good is the fact that they decided to create a whole... Uh, performance around Special Herbs, which is an MF Doom release. It's an instrumental from, you know, his his other works. But uh, yeah, I I love the kind of like the iteration of like MPC, like APC, you know, like everything inside the box type of like processing from analog drum machines, and then translating that into actual live instruments. It's fantastic. Like think of DJ Spooky. I was talking to a friend of mine in New York. Uh, and they were just explaining to me like the the impact, the cultural impact that DJ Spooky had by bringing an orchestra on stage and rescoring um, this this pretty notable film about you know white supremacy in the U.S. and also like Juan Atkinson 
you know, comes to mind and like, uh, like Derek May from Underground Resistance and like, uh, yeah, so many individuals come to mind where there's like this interplay between like electronic instruments and also real life, uh, like performances. I also think about like Del the Funky Homo Sapien. He's, he's the first individual that I, I could remember or think of that brought like a full blown orchestra on stage and like rapped on it. Um, for those that don't know, that's Ice Cube's cousin and he's like a futurist. Uh, his, his, you know, alternate alias is Deltron 3030. He's worked with like gorillas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, I think about all these different, like, uh, kind of interconnected ways of articulating, like, you know, analog, this insular type of, like, hermit, isolated production into a community that's performing this sound that was made in a very isolated space. And, like, both are very valid, and, and they're both, in, you know, incredibly important when it comes to the compatibility of, of expression. Um, I also think about, like, Jeff Mills and Axis Records, uh, you know, Je Jeff Mills was also one of the first individuals to play with a, an 808 and a full-blown orchestra on stage, which is pretty profound, at least, you know, through my research. And yeah, just like this interconnectedness between classical and contemporary is really important for people to kind of like dig into and, and to deconstruct. Um, so yeah, I think it's just as valuable, if not more, you know, sometimes less, depending on how it's executed, how well the production is and the mixing is. Um, but yeah, it's really important to to find value in, in both like live instrumentation and, and also like the uh, the production aspect of, of things through through like machines. But yeah. So let me I have it ready. So here it is, guys. Pretty much, and it's so it's so interesting. This this track encompasses a lot of the concepts that Nick was just talking about. Where um, it does, there is a compliment that um, is within this track. Uh, there's a compliment to those virtual instruments and how they relate to the live sounds that we all know and love as well. So everything that he just spoke of is encompassed here. And here it is, guys. Enjoy. This song is called Live Sounds. in the music and the messages they just get so confusing and contrary to popular belief and eye opener we could all use one these live sounds that we've left behind but with everything so digital now in time and with everything moving so fast how can anyone ever keep up blinded by the misinterpretation a message was given, but none was taken. It's poisonous to our health and nature, but everyone just moves on, they're pacing. All suspended in disbelief, the sounds of nature are now obsolete. The sound of computers now fill our days and weeks, and these live sounds are put to sleep. The sound of pianos and flutes just fill me up. Saxophones, violins, and acoustic drums. These live sounds that we've laid to rest With no memorial service, just fade to black A virtual sound just sounds right It sounds good, it sounds nice It sounds tight but it's just not natural When them live sounds start coming at you Birds chirping in the early morning Just take some time to stop and enjoy it And plus the sound of the wind blowing those live sounds, it ain't nothing like them. Deaf ears to the mass appeal. Classic feel like classical music. Chopin and Mozart. 
These live sounds that fill my heart Yeah Live sounds coming at you Wow, that was uh, that's pretty incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, that body of work, that, that composition, the very deep lyrics there. Um, one of the things that stood out to me was like, nature sounds are obsolete, you know? And what's, what's funny to me is that you literally have someone right next to you, Justice, that makes an effort of fusing the, you know, nature sounds and electronic sounds into one yeah and, and you all can like chop it up he's also into like osd music so so you all can i think talk for hours um but uh but yeah it's so interesting to be able to take influence from nature to take influence from the cadence found in a cicada or in a bird or in a cricket you know because those are polyrhythms in there sometimes and they're like odd time signatures inside of there sample it put it through a granulizer like uh, put a compressor through it, like a multi-band compressor, put an EQ on it, like, uh, and sample nature because she's always teaching us something new. So uh, very profound lyrics that, that you've written. Thank you for sharing. Thank you so, so, so much for sharing, yeah. Absolutely. It's So my inspiration for bringing nature, um, because yeah, I, I have heard um, a lack of nature sounds being used in like, you know, different styles. Um, and of course, it's a bit of hyperbole, right? And I don't mean, obviously, I don't mean all the way obsolete, but what I mean is, um, from my perspective, is what I mean. So there's a bit of hyperbole there. But yes, I my inspiration for, for like you said, it's so you brought up crickets and polyrhythms. The thing about nature and sampling it, one of my favorite things is um, there's a composer, uh, a 20th century composer named John Cage. A lot of people know him. And he was what he did, what what people call chance music. So he would take these uh, star charts, which are charts that would um, where like he would be like a constellation of stars in the sky. And he would um, take and he would, you know, make star charts. He would take sheet music and wherever there was a star, he would put a note and he would play it. And of course, it would sound like crazy. Right. But it, the, the idea of it was was absolutely insane to me. And I love that concept. So what I would do is um, when I one of the things I would do to challenge myself as a producer is I would, like you said, I would record these nature sounds, no matter what the rhythm was, no matter if the bird was chirping on a beat or not. And I would try to make different um, polyrhythms or beats or progressive or maybe a progressive rock or something like that, using these different sounds and uh, sampling them and using them. And it was just so fun. And once I learned a lot about myself creatively when I was doing that you know and just having a natural appreciation for those sounds as well is is very important I think as well because like you said mother nature is always teaching us something and mother nature always has something to say as we've learned throughout life and as I've learned mother nature a hundred percent always has something to say so yeah and she's done a pretty good job of outliving all of us collectively so a lot of wisdom there. <laughs> she has a lot of children. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you want to you want to play the next one? Yes. Okay. Cool. You want to intro it? Yeah, of course, absolutely. So the second track that I've prepared for you guys is a song called "Mad Scientist." Um, it features an old buddy of mine named Lou Hound, um, who's um, an up and coming artist in the underground for a while now. And um, it was, you know, one of the one of the first, not the first collaboration track that I've done. And I love collaborating. Collaborating is something I absolutely love doing. Um, another thing that I always said when I became a producer was I'm going to do like as many collaborations for a multitude of reasons. One, if, you know, I want to introduce other people to my fan base and vice versa and really create opportunities for people. 
Um, and I'll, I, I love collaborating, especially with artists who are kind of on the rise. They're hungry. They're motivated. They have something to say, which is always very important to me. And that is the idea of this next song. It's actually not super complex. The whole idea of this song was that I had something to say about my perception of life and society. And so did Lou Hound. And we came together to create Mad Scientist. I hope you guys enjoy. And I'll let Nick talk to you guys about why having something to say is very important when you're songwriting as well. Uh, yeah, it's just a matter of articulating your subjective truth and expressionism. So, yeah, I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> I just woke up to a new day, and today I want to experience life in a new way. But everything just seems so confusing, astounded by the acts of violence. Trying to see and live life beyond the horizon. Trying to cross over to the side where there's blue skies and sunshine. But it just feels like a rainy day. And what a shameful way to live life as a pessimist or an immobile bystander. What high standards we have when we accept mediocrity for greatness. And never aim to be greater than what we know we're better than this evidence. Shows a lack of intelligence that we may never get back. Seeing through the outrageous nature that surrounds us and what a ground crushing epiphany that it must have been. We're clustered in so much sin, craving lust again. I'm just a man, well it's time to go bust a nut again. Cause opposition and resentment's just another friend. Belonging to the masses and creating lifetime passes. For narcissists and egotists delivering the gases. And toxic poison to all the classes. What a disaster, a masterful collaboration. These spawns of Satan delivering us to Armageddon. The role models are so swallowed up by the rest. This whole system is no system of equalness. This nonsense we feed on with is evilness. And our kids never get a chance to be the best. My mind saying let go, but my heart saying I know what the problem is. Now how the hell do I solve it and keep my sanity? All is this lost in vanity. Coughing is shut and the lights are off and it's dark and hope is just about lost. It's like I'm losing my head. I'm laying in bed. I can't sleep. Anxiety's got me like some mad scientist. It's like we're losing our souls. We have no control. Society's got us crazy like some mad scientist. It's like I'm losing my head, I'm laying in bed, I can't sleep, anxiety's got me like some mad scientist. It's like we're losing our souls, we have no control, society's got us crazy like some mad scientist. So let go, then we only take hold, once big it's in our heart, let the demon stay home. So I'm never alone, it got me thinking I don't know who to trust, when the phone ring and I'm stopping just stuck, I don't know. If I should answer or what? Lifestyle got me swapping numbers. It could be you or little dude searching for work. He want a ball too, so we work hard till dawn. Dreaming about the money falling like dude. So what it do? Bitches all up in my business. I'm like, ho, oh, what's it to you? Sticking like glue to play your attitudes and getting twisted in the mix. My soul grown cold like blue with the snow because bitches after my riches. But who am I kidding? Reminiscing as a kid in slides, missing a father figure. He ain't thinking nothing but money. True stunner. Coming from a country with nothing. It's like I'm losing my head, I'm laying in bed, I can't sleep, anxiety's got me like some mad scientist. It's like we're losing our souls, we have no control, society's got us crazy like some mad scientist. It's like I'm losing my head, I'm laying in bed, I can't sleep, anxiety's got me like some mad scientist. It's like we're losing our souls, we have no control, society's got us crazy like some mad scientist. Yeah, so I'm I'm pretty stunned after that track. That's actually the first time that I hear that track. Um, what what was your thought process when you were writing this? How much of this is freestyled? How much of it is like pen and paper? Like how? Like, cause I hear like 3MG, I I hear Doom, I hear Aesop Rock, I hear like a lot of influences. Even your flow, your cadence, like it's still very unique, you know, outside of influences. So like, what's your thought process when you're when you're making something like? Cause you also made the beat too, right? Okay, so you, you produced the beat, and I'm sure you mixed as well. That seems like it was a, a low-fidelity export intentionally because it's on YouTube. Um, but yeah, purely from like a writing standpoint, I guess, right, in terms of lyricism, what was going through your mind? How did you put that uh, you know, concept on paper? Um, yeah, I'm just like fascinated by, by that process. 
So, yeah. Um, well, first and foremost, yeah, it was um, supposed to be kind of gritty a little bit, not super clean. And then the interesting thing about it being on YouTube is YouTube automatically like compresses things. So that made it even more of this kind of natural gritty feeling. But yeah, that was on purpose when it came to the production and it not being super clean and and, you know, being a little gritty. Now, lyrics wise, it's so interesting. Really quick story for the listeners. When, when, I, when I approached Lou about doing this back in 2013, that's how long ago we did this, um, he, was, he called me one day and he was like, you know, I just wanted to give you an update that I'm, I'm going to be sending you the verse soon. He said, uh, I said, uh, he said to be, to be honest with you, he said, um, the hold up, he said, bro, it's your lyrics, bro. I, I, he was like, bro, I, how am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> And I was like, you want me to sing you a different song? He was like, no, 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 it's great. I love it. It's just, how am I supposed to follow that? He was like, bro, it's your lyrics, bro. I, how am I supposed to follow that? Nah, real cool, dude. But nonetheless, um, you know, when, when I'm having these ideas, right, what happens is you have these thoughts, right? And you're, you're, my goal is to take these thoughts and put them in the words, and I have to put, I want to have, make sure the flow is great, though. Uh, the lyricism has to be great. It, this is one of the songs that, you know, I sat in, you know, my studio and I really took, to be honest, three to four hours trying to not perfect because nothing is perfect. Plus, I didn't want it to be perfect. I wanted it to be flawed, you know, because society's flawed. We're flawed, you know, so I wanted it to be flawed. But trying to get the vision, trying to get my vision into a song, it took about a good three, four hours to really pin that verse and really make sure every word had meaning. Even words like it or and, every single word had meaning. So when you hear, um, you know, when you hear the end of the song, my mind saying let go, but my heart saying I know what the problem is. Now how the hell do I solve it and keep my sanity? All is this lost in vanity, coughing and shut, and the lights are off and it's dark and hope is just about lost. Every single word, I wanted to have a meaning. I wanted people to understand every single ideal, every single concept, every belief, every value, that this is what I'm trying to say. The message I'm trying to get through to you is that we really need to do some self-reflection on what's going on in society because we as human beings don't do enough self-reflection. What we do is we lead with our egos instead of our heart. That's one issue. We lie to ourselves to the point that we believe our own lies to keep ourselves from having to face certain truths. We constantly make sure we're on the move. We don't like to sit still. The reason why you, people don't like to sit still is because when you sit still, you're forced to think about your actual problems and solutions, and we don't want to. We don't want to face our fears. We don't want to face our problems. So the reason why we're constantly on the move is because of when we sit still, now we're forced to think about that stuff. You know, and these, and we, so we never self-reflect, and that's kind of the issue, and that's the point that I'm trying to, uh, Lou and I are trying to get across on the song is that we've done, we've taken the time out to really examine ourselves and the people around us, and this is what we've noticed. So his verse, he at the end of his verse, he says, um, um, you know, I'm trying to get away from from just messing with all different types of women because I feel like the little bit of money I have, he says, bitches after my riches, but who am I kidding? When I'm reminiscing as a kid in slides missing the father figure, I wasn't I was thinking nothing but money. You know, trying to be a true stunner because I came from a country with nothing. So because um, I think he's from a, a, another country, if I'm not mistaken, maybe a third world esque type of country. So he was basically saying, so that's the reflection I had to sit back and do. I'm sitting here paranoid about people trying to take the little bit that I got. But I, I to an ex even though I don't agree with it, I understand it when I was growing up with nothing. You know, I was thinking nothing but money. How am I going to get this money? Am I going to commit crimes? No. He actually turned to writing rhymes instead, which is a great, great decision because he's very talented. My reflection was the same thing. Like, well, I'm a man. Um, and, you know, when we're teenagers, we, you know, we, we lust after girls. I have a bar in there where I'm like, I'm just a man. Well, it's time to go bust a nut again. But then um, I, I realized, no, this isn't the way. Um, I don't want to be craving after sin or lusting after this sin my entire life. Because if I don't self-reflect now and notice that this isn't the right decision to make, that's going to hurt me in the future. 
So that's what the song is about. It's about us self-reflecting and saying, this is what we've noticed and within ourselves, but and also in society. Because judging society without judging yourself is pointless. You got to judge yourself too, because we are flawed as well. And we are a part of this society. We're a part of this system. So that's the idea of the song. So the the hard part was, or the fun part for me actually, was taking that and formulating it into words that could have an impact, very, very, very heavy impact in every single word in the verse. And shout outs to Lou, he killed it. And um, I'm proud of what we, uh, what we made there with Mad Scientist. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty amazing, um, kind of like the lyricism behind it. I'm gonna have to re-listen to that because I'm definitely into, into hip hop music of that, of that caliber. So uh, thank you so much for sharing. Did you did you want to talk a little bit more? Did you want to share the third the third track? Well, how how are you let's feeling? Do it. Let's, um, let's close it out. Okay. So first and foremost, man, um, being at Miami Community Radio uh, with Justice alongside us, um, and being here with Nick and Mauricio, I am honored to be here. It it has been a pleasure, you know, talking to you guys, um, getting to know you guys, and introducing you guys to myself. Um, I'm talking to the listeners now. Um, shout outs to each and every one of you. You guys are appreciated as when you have uh, something like what these guys do here at Miami Community Radio. Um, what they do is very important, especially community is very important. But also one of the things I know these guys understand is without the listeners, they don't, they're nothing. They don't exist. You guys are the foundation. You know, um, you guys help keep this platform uh um, impactful. So shout outs to each and every one of these guys here, but also shout outs to the listeners. And um, you guys are greatly appreciated. And to show my appreciation, I'm going to present um, this final track to you guys. This is the track that I chose to save for last because um, over the years when I've played this track for people, it is the track that I've gotten the most compliments on. People love this track from top to bottom it's a song called upon awakening this song conceptually is so so complex um but basically one of the main goals of this song was to take my creativity to its absolute peak from the beat to the fact that it samples my favorite song of all time which is bring me to life by evanescence to both verses and I wanted every aspect of this. I wanted to take my creativity and put it to its peak. And so I wanted to write about something that was new. So I wanted to take a concept that we all know, right? Um, not only being in love with someone, but that person's love literally saving your life. This song is the, the concept of this song is someone's love for you, like you being on the edge, you ready to give up, and someone's love for you saving your life, which has happened to me. So this song, and Upon Awakening, the title literally means uh, upon my awakening, my, my, my second chance at life that your love has given me, I realize that I am worthy to live. I am somebody. I am not just a waste of space. I am not a nobody in the universe. Your love has shown this to me. And now, upon my awakening and my second chance at life, I realize this, and I'm going to make sure that I not only appreciate myself, but I appreciate you as well. And I'm going to live for me, for you, and for all the people who I have the ability to impact and, and affect and make their lives better as well and let them realize, no, you're not. You, you're, you may be an outcast, but you're not a waste. You're not a nobody. You deserve to live. You deserve to exist and coexist amongst everybody else in the world. That is the concept of this next piece, and I hope you guys enjoy it. This is Upon Awakening. And once again, um, I'll let Nick give his closing thoughts while I load up the track. Yeah, so we've been uh, we've been here for about an hour um, at this point. This is definitely the shortest uh, interview that we've we've done so far, but it's short and sweet. And uh, I'm happy we've actually made the time to be able to connect and, and go this deep. Uh, and you know, you all are able to see a side of Furious that he probably doesn't show or reveal to most people. So uh, this is a very historic, uh, in in my opinion. You know, NGP Speaks and MCR show in general. So I'm happy it's going to be immortalized on the internet. 
um, so that you can share it with friends and family. Um, and yeah, just give like context to the community at large about who Furious is and, and what Furious has gone through and how he expresses himself in this incarnation. Uh, very powerful figure, character, and uh, community member. So I'm just, I'm happy we were able to do this. So, yeah. So by the way, my, um, I, I, my sincerest apologies, Nick, I forgot to ask you. Um, by the way, um, are there any more questions that you have for me before we close it out? Because my motto, one of my mottos in life is if you can make the time, so can I. And I would, I would, you are more than welcome to much more of my time. I love what we've done here today. And if there's more to be discussed, if there's more to be learned for me, because, you know, I said earlier, I'm addicted to learning. Um, I would love it. So if you have any more questions, we don't have to close now. Feel free to ask. Um, the track is there ready to play. We can save that for later. If you have more questions, more things you want to know or more things you you know, your listeners very well too. things that you think they might want to know. Feel free. I'm I'm here. Well, I mean, we can always do a part two as well. Uh, that's always a possibility. It'd have to be remote or you know virtual, but we can always figure that out. Um, I would say like the main question that I have for you is if you could speak to Furious 20 years ago, right? Fur Furious 15 years ago, what wisdom and advice would you give that Furious that may be going through a lot, uh, failing to be understood by the people around them, maybe may not have any parental figures to be able to guide them in the right direction. Uh, what words of wisdom and advice would you give someone that, you know, has gone through or that is currently going through very similar things that you have gone through in life? Um, yeah. What, what wisdom would you be able to impart to them? So that's a two-parter. So I'll first start with what I would say to myself uh, 15 years ago. Yeah, not a, definitely a hard time for me. Um, you know, unfortunately, around that time, I actually, um, I was a freshman in high school. Um, I unfortunately, um, you know, had a, a run-in with a suicide attempt. I was put into crisis, a crisis center for a week, and met some incredible people there. And the thing is, I have a very good memory. So still to this day, I was only there for a week, February 15th to the 22nd. I remember it by the day. And um, I still remember each and every one of those people because they all... Uh, showed me, um, uh, you know, different things and I learned different things from them. And they they impacted my life in ways that I don't even think they know, interestingly enough. And um, I would say to that furious, just hold on. Um, just pretty much um, similar to what you guys are going to hear in the track, I would say some of these things. Um, let your creativity be your savior. Um, when you feel like you're at your lowest and you feel like you have nothing, you know, just know that that is not true because your creativity is something nobody can take from you and it will save you because that's what ended up saving me, writing more songs, uh, listening to more music and drawing inspiration. Um, you know, uh, it's, you know, listening to um, other other people who've been through what I've been through um, and, and like the people at the crisis center who do understand me because outside of there it did feel like no one understood me but that's what i would tell myself hold on you are worthy let your creativity be your savior it is not the end it should not have to be the end there's no reason why you should have these thoughts of wanting to end it because if you do there's so many things that you have in that mind of yours that you're not going to get to show the world if you end it now that's what I would tell myself. And segueing into the second question, that's what I would also tell um, someone who feels that way. If you're a creative in any way, whether you draw, do music, write poetry, whether you're, if you're good at public speaking and you know you want to impact change maybe as an activist in your community, um, maybe you're a good teacher. Maybe you're, you're good with financial literacy. That's something that our community could use as well. Maybe you have something to give. It is not the end. It is not over. Find what, your, what it is you have to give this world. Find what your impact can be on this world and give it to the world. Give the world that gift and use that as 
something to motivate you, to keep you going. When you see the impact that what your gift has to offer on other people, when you see that impact and you see how you've changed other people's lives, it is an amazing feeling that nobody can take away from you. And I wouldn't give that up for the world. So that's what I would tell the a younger me, and that's what I would tell someone who's who feels like they're an outcast, who feels like they have nothing to offer the world. You may have just not found what it is yet that you have to offer the world. It took me a while to find it. Sometimes it takes people a while to find it. And you may just keep holding on. Whatever makes you happy, use that and amplify it. If listening to music makes you happy, listen to music to stay strong. If pure serenity makes you happy, find a quiet place. If you're, if you're a kid and you live at home with a big family, um, maybe at night, maybe the closet, you know, is somewhere you can go for pure serenity on the front porch, um, you know, in the bathroom, um, you know, late at night. But find that serenity if you know, watching anime makes you happy, you know, do it to your heart's extent. Use that as a way to keep yourself up until you find what it is that you have to offer the world, until you find what it is that you have that will impact change. You will find it. Trust me. It may take a long time, but trust me, you'll find it right on time. Absolutely powerful. That's a fantastic way to close today's uh, today's interview. Um, so yeah, we can just play, play the track. And uh, thank you, thank you for your words of wisdom and, and your knowledge. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, and then also after the song, let's try to figure out um, where people can find your music, how they can connect with you and, and stuff like that. So, yeah. As I lay upon existence in this mortal plane Thoughts of everyday life just causes mortal pain And suffering beyond all hopes and imagination And if I end it right now, would you be right there waiting? Would you breathe back into me and create life? An introspective perspective, see I just hate life But I deserve life, or so I'm told by a wise man Who once told me to preserve life Will I see the sunlight again and bask in the earth's light? And I guess that I should be thankful that it hurts, right? Because I'd rather feel pain than nothing at all If my happiness is an illusion, I'm destined to fall When touch from your hand and the blood starts to rush through me. My heart is pumping again, but I'm still not moving. One kiss from your lips, and I'm able to rise again. If your love for me is immortal, I'll never die again. Like I'm on another beaten path to eternity As I jeopardize my existence, I'm not concerned the least You stand next to me, your eyes full of pure light It pierces right to my soul, you tell me it burns bright I'll be awakened again if only by your love My soul's breaking in this longing for your touch Like rainfall, just shelter me from my own tears Under the moonlight, we embrace and conquer our own fears Be my escape from all of the pain, torture and evil Show me that death can really be good in other people As I walk down this dark path, my vision is funneled I see your hand through the light at the end of the tunnel I reach for it and reach, but I ain't making Yet. My mind is just like a maze, it's over complex Emancipation of imagination keeps me from you I listen and follow your voice, it guides me back to you
this. So if you guys are interested, um, one of the things that I'm just now getting into a lot more is social media. So I'm going to um, just tell you guys where you can find me. Um, fear, um, on Twitter, um, it's at Furious. Um, that's spelled just like the word, F-U-R-I-O-U-S, underscore Blue Eyes, B-L-U-E-Y-E-S, on Twitter. And I'll have a link in my bio to the YouTube channel where all of the music that you heard today is, okay? Um, if you guys are interested in going to the YouTube channel, uh, I accidentally messed up when I made the name back in the day because it's supposed to be B-N-E Records, which stands for Brand New Era Records. Um, 1632, but I accidentally put the 1632 in between a bunch of the letters. So it's going to be B-N-E-R-E-C-O, 1632-R-D-S. I'm going to try to fix that. I think I can. Um, back in the day, they didn't used to let you, but I think now you can. So I'm going to try to fix that to be B-N-E Records. But nonetheless, um, if you go to, to um, and follow me on Twitter at Furious underscore Blue Eyes, I'm getting more into social media and using it as a promotional tool because I was never a big social media person. But I, I realized that I, I could use it as a promotional tool. So if you guys follow me on there, I will put a link to my, um, in my bio to where you can find all the pieces you heard today, plus a couple more. So there's a couple more on that channel as well. And once again, you guys enjoy the rest of your day. Um, take care. Um, peace world. And just remember to please just treat everyone nicely and kindly and with respect. And yeah, there you guys go. And thanks again to Nick for having me on Miami Community Radio. Yeah, and thank you for, for being a guest and for doing your thing here and, and for closing us out. I also want to say for those that only have IG or maybe just like um, no MCRs, you have an Instagram as well? Okay, let's let's plug that too. Yeah. So yes, I do have an Instagram as well. So if you guys have Instagram, okay? It's for the love of music 001 is my Instagram, okay? So it's at for the love of music 001. No, no, no. The word for F O R T H E L O V E O F M U S I C. Everything is spelled out. For the love of music, 001 is where you guys can find me. It's a pretty um, fresh Instagram page. So if, if you notice that it is um, only has a, a few followers, that is that is that is the one. Once again, I'm just now getting into using social media as a promotional tool. So just work with me on that. I'm learning more about what I can do with it and how I can utilize it as a promotional tool. Um, so at For the Love of Music 001 and at Furious underscore Blue Eyes on Twitter. And I will once again have links in both of those bios for those of you who have um, Instagram as well to where you guys can hear those songs again on YouTube. And like I said, there's a couple more there for you guys to enjoy as well. So there you guys have it. If you guys want to chat and communicate with me, feel free to either at me or DM me on any of those platforms. One of my favorite things to do is take music recommendations and recommend music myself. Or if you guys want production, songwriting, and composition tips or to just discuss, I'm always here. So just DM me or at me, and we can definitely have a conversation. So there you go. And there you have it. Thank you so much, Furious. Uh, this has been a total blessing uh, to have you on here and to pick your brain. And yeah, let's see if we're able to do this for a second time before I head out to uh, to Europe. But yeah, have an amazing day, everyone. Uh, we have some incredible talent lined up. We got uh, Steffi and Sylvia later on. We have Daisy Cutter, Stephanie. Uh, we have Oscar Dune Dogs. Just amazing people from the community gonna spin, gonna do some DJ sets. So yeah, thank you for tuning into MCR. And with that, have an amazing day. Bless. <laughs>